right. Hello, folks. Um, my name is Shadid. I work in the developer relations team at Research in Motion. I'm here to talk to you about probably one of the most important frameworks in BlackBerry 10. It's called Invocation Framework. Um, invocation Framework um, stands for its name. It lets you invoke other applications to do different tasks. Now, there are many different ways to do invocation, but what we did in BlackBerry 10, I'm sure you'll be impressed. To look back at history, invocation has always been very popular in the PC world. Imagine the context menu in Windows. It lets you open files using arbitrary application. So those are sort of the invocation that we're talking about here. You could also, in your desktop browser, you could also invoke or click on a PDF link. And instead of launching the Adobe Reader in a new window, it could actually load it right into the browser. So that's an embedded experience. So that's another thing we're going to talk about. However, it's so, it was not so popular in the mobile space, except for BlackBerry. BlackBerry always provided or had the APIs to integrate not only with system applications, but also with third-party applications or applications that exposes hooks to get integrated with. Now, in BlackBerry 10, we're taking that experience miles ahead by providing a user experience that is unmatched, and it really provides a smooth, integrated, and what I like to call it, frictionless user experience. So when you invoke an application, it always causes a shock to the user because it's kind of confusing because you're, you're in a new application right now. But with BlackBerry Flow, we made it in a way so that the user actually understands what just happened. So all the user experience part is covered. And what I really like to put, it, put forward as is it's multitasking with the BlackBerry Flow concept. Now, what would Invocation Framework do for your application? It'll make your application social, and it'll make your application integrated. Like I said, not only with core applications, but also with any third-party application that is capable of handling invocations. And multiply that with the BlackBerry Flow experience that we have embedded right into the framework so that you don't have to worry about that. And the experience will be consistent across the application no matter from where the user invokes using your application to another application. So the first thing I would like to talk about is put forward a hypothetical example. And it makes it much easier to visualize how Invocation Framework works in BlackBerry 10. So if you have BBM trying to open a doc file, but it doesn't really know which apps on the device can open a doc file. BBM doesn't, can't do it, so it wants to invoke somebody. But it's a very valid use case for BBM to let the user invoke or open a doc file so that the user can open whatever doc file it received, he or she received over a chat session. Now, on the other side of the story, we have these apps. Two of them can open doc files, and one of them can open image files. And BBM still doesn't know the other side. So that's exactly where Invocation Framework comes in. It allows BBM to request the framework that it needs to open a doc file. And Invocation Framework does a little magic and finds the right target and invokes it with the content it needs to render. You might have noticed that there are two applications that can open doc files, but why was one preferred over the other? So the process of finding suitable targets, in this case there are two, this is called target brokering. And to select, to, to be able to select one of them based on some set of criteria, that's called target selection. So these are proprietary concepts to us. Now, the target selection, the, well, the brokering is done based on what parameters was passed into the invocation request itself. It contains a whole list of criteria or parameters that we'll talk about very soon. However, the target selection is based on how strong a match was the request with the target's capability. So the strongest match wins. We're going to talk a little bit more about the 
target selection process. Hopefully we'll have time at the end to answer a lot of questions about this. Now, the invocation we just saw is known as unbound invocation. It's called unbound because BBM had no idea which application is going to be invoked. Neither it had any idea about which application was actually invoked. It doesn't care, right, as long as the framework finds a suitable target for it. Now, the other example is obviously called bound invocation. In this case, BBM actually knows which application it wants to launch. So in this case, BBM wants Dr. Doc to open the document file. But they still don't have any pipe between them so that they can communicate. So what does BBM do? It sends a request to the invocation framework saying, please open this doc file using Dr. Doc. So it's actually specifying which application it needs to open. Invocation framework, what does it do? It doesn't do any brokering or any target selection. It simply blindly invokes Dr. Doc and God help Dr. Doc depending on what parameters BBM passed on, right? You could pass totally invalid parameters to these kind of invocation. Obviously, the target application might crash or behave unexpectedly. Really shouldn't do that. Unless you know, unless you know the target application really well, what parameters it needs, and what action it supports, you should not be doing bound invocation blindly because invocation framework will not check anything. So let's look into what goes in to the invocation request and what are the actors involved in a request. So obviously there is a client side that requests the invocation in our hypothetical example, that would be BBM. And there is a target, that's the application that gets invoked. And it also is obviously able to handle the invocation. Now there are two parts to the invocation requests. One is the action, so that describes what you want it to perform. And there is a data portion of the request. The data portion basically describes the data, the actual content upon which the, app, the action needs to be performed. Now, let's go into details about actions and data. For actions, it, like I said, it basically defines the task that needs to be performed. One example would be bb.action.open. So this action essentially means that you're trying to open something. And targets define what actions they can handle when they register with the invocation framework. So as a target, you have to be very specific to say, to tell the framework that these are the capabilities that you have when it comes to invocation. And client specifies when it sends the invocation request, what actions it needs to perform. Now there are some platform actions defined that everybody will know about, and, but you are not restricted to those actions. You can always define your own custom action, like in this example, com.example.myAction, but make sure that they're unique in the way so that it does not conflict with an action defined by another third party. So the rule of thumb is always to go by your domain name and then define the action. That way, it's kind of guaranteed that it's, um, it's not, it, that it's unique. Now the data portion has three parts. It's basically trying to describe the data as much as we can so that, so that it helps invocation framework to find the best fit target as well as to help the target understand the content itself. So the first parameter describing the data is called URI. So you can, if you have the data in the file system somewhere, could be in your sandbox, could be in a shared, shared space, doesn't matter, you can point invocation framework that my data is there. So it's not part of the invocation request. So that's how you specify a location for the content. MIME type is also very important. MIME type describes what kind of data is contained by that file. Now, for some files, if it's a PNG file, for example, invocation framework already knows what's the MIME type for this. So if we ignore 
or skip the MIME type parameter, invocation framework is going to try to guess by looking at the file extension. That could be wrong um, because the content might not be PNG. It could be something else. If you ignore or skip the MIME type, the invocation framework will predict what MIME type it is and just pass it on. But if you want to enforce a specific MIME type for your invocation or the data, you can do that by specifying a specific MIME type. Now, there is a data attribute associated with the invocation request. We've seen how we can define the data to be in a separate location in a URI variable. But if you want to attach the data right within the invocation request itself, you can do so by setting any byte arrays or any number of bytes to the data parameter. However, there are some limitations on size, obviously, and we'll look into that in more details very soon. Now, to summarize all the concepts that I've talked about, there are two types of invocation, bound and unbound. In bound invocation, there is no brokering. Target, if it's found, is going to be invoked blindly with whatever parameter you have passed onto it. And you must know the target ID because you have to tell the invocation framework which application you want to invoke. You do that by specifying the target ID. So each target, when it registers, has an ID and that it, it identifies itself with that ID. So you must specify that. Now, how would you know a target ID? There are really two ways to know it. One, you had a phone conversation with the developer that built the target. Or two, you can query the invocation framework to get you a list of um, suitable targets for your invocation, and then you can pick one from there and just do a bound invocation to that. So there's just really two ways to find the target ID and do a bound invocation. Now, on the other hand, the unbound invocation does both brokering, it finds the list of candidates, and it also does target selection based on the strongest match. Now, it's always nice to see code, especially in a developer conference. So let's look at how we can send an invocation. And in this case, we're, what we're doing is we're sending a bound invocation. The first step is to initialize something called an invoke manager. Now this class is going to be central to the invocation framework or how you code it. Then you define an invoke request that will wrap all the request parameters that you have. And then you set a target because it's a bound invocation. In this case, I'm just setting it to com.example.myTarget. And then you set a whole bunch of invocation request properties, such as the action, the MIME type, and I'm also setting the URI to be some PDF file in the file system. And once you are done with setting up your invoke request, all you need to do is call invoke manager.invoke. That will return a reply object. Now the reply object will really, what it really does is it tells you that whether the invocation succeeded or failed. Now right after you invoke, you can't just read invoke reply because it's actually empty until the invocation is done. So what do we do? We connect with a signal called finished that comes from invoke reply and we connect it to whatever slot we want it to connect to. Once we've connected that, you're going to, your slot is going to be called whenever the invocation is complete. So that's when your slot gets called, and inside that slot, you parse the error attribute of the invoke reply and decide or see whether the invocation succeeded or failed. Now, there is another way to do bound invocation. What if you don't know the target ID? What do you do? You do well, you can either call the guy or you can do query. So this is a very important part of invocation framework. It allows you to discover apps that you don't know about. So to do a query, you need to again initialize an invoke manager object, and then you need to set up an invoke query target request object. And in that invoke target query request, you set very similar parameter to invoke request parameters. You set an action, Set a MIME type, well, that's for this example, and 
what it's really trying to say is I want to find all targets that can open PNG files. Now, what you get back, now to send the query, you call invoke manager dot query targets. Now that'll send the query request, but it's not done yet, but you do get a handle in iQuery reply for whatever reply there is. Now when, so what do you do? You basically connect the finished signal of invoke query target reply and connect it with your slot. And your slot will get called when the query is finished and your invoke query targets reply will ha already has all the query results. So once you have that, you can go in and parse your query result and see what targets are there. And you can also get all the invoke ID, sorry, the target IDs of each of the targets in that, from that query result. Now, if you, so far so, so far so good? I mean, sir, cool. So if you thought invocation was easy so far, wait till you see this. In this example, all I'm doing is creating an invoke request, setting a URI, and just saying invoke. So invocation framework is going to go out and look at the file extension. OK, it's a PDF file. I know the MIME type for that. And it's going to find the targets that supports opening PDF files. And if it finds a target, it's just going to invoke it. So with just you know, literally four or less lines of code, you can invoke to open a file. How did it know that you wanted to open? Because there is a default action um, for everything. So open would be a default action in this case. And that's how invocation framework just assumed that you probably want to open it, right? OK. So let's move to the other side of the story. How do we become a target? So we have seen how to invoke, how to query, how to do bound invocation, and how to do unbound invocation. And now, you can also become a target exposing your capabilities to other applications so that they can invoke you to perform some task that you're good at. Now, to register as a target, you don't need to write any code. Well, you do need to write some, but to register, you really don't need to write any code except going into your bar descriptor.xml and defining an invoke target tag. And as soon as you give it an ID, that's actually good enough to register yourself as a target because that's all it needs to do bound invocation to your application, right? However, if you want to do unbound invocation, you have to do something more. So, so as long as you have a target ID, you're good to go. They can find you if they know your target ID. You don't need to specify what MIME type you support, what action you support, because the invocation framework really doesn't care when you're doing a bound invocation. So you might want to have a good contract between the guys who are invoking you. Now, if you want to be discovered in queries, or if you want to let other applications to invoke you in an unbound fashion, you want to f you, what you want to declare is some filter tags that describes your capabilities. So what the filter tag really does is it tells invocation framework what action you support, what content type you support, and what URIs you support. So in this case, what this target is saying is it can view or open PDF or XPDF type content that are sent as file, as a file clone slash slash pot or a data clone slash slash local. I don't think I've mentioned what data clone slash slash local is. Data clone slash slash local is defined as the URI when you want the data to be attached within the invocation request itself. So remember the in-band data versus URI data? If, you're, if you want to send in-band data, what you like to do is you want to set the URI to a data clone slash slash. So this target is saying it can also handle in-band data for opening or viewing PDF files. Here's another example. 
A little bit different, pretty much the same as before, but it has a subtle difference that's important. In this case, what it's saying is, I can view or open any type of content, really not, that are sent over a URI value of file colon slash slash, and that is the extension PDF. So although you have defined star to be the MIME type, the PDF extension will catch or filter the requests. So only PDF type, types, typed extensions will come through you as invocation requests. Now let's, now once you've registered for being an invocation target, you want to write code to handle your invocation requests. The way you do it is, again, you create an instance of the invoke manager, and then you connect the signal invoked with whatever slot you want it to connect to. And in your application startup code or your entry point, the main method or whatever that is, you want to catch or parse the invoke manager dot startup mode. What the startup mode will tell you is how your application was launched. Did the user launch it from the home screen or was it a consequence of an invocation? So you can detect those at, in your entry point of your application. However, whenever you get invoked, your slot gets called that's connected to the invoked signal. What this slot gives you, or this callback gives you, is an invoke request object, exactly the same object that, is, that was passed on to the invocation framework. And in the, from this object, you can find what the source was, that means who was the client who invoked you, what was it specified, uh, sorry, which target did it invoke in your application. Remember, applications can have multiple targets defined in the same bar descriptor, so you might want to know which target did the client or source invoke. And you can also parse the action, the URI, and the data portion of the request. All right, so let's look at um, a little bit advanced topic of how you can send in-band data when you don't want to specify a location for your data, but you want to attach the data as part of the invocation request, that's what's called in-band data. And this is done by setting the URI to data colon slash that's local, or when the URI is not set at all. If, it, if there is no URI set by the client, invocation framework is going to, going to assume that the URI is data colon slash slash local. And the size limit on this in-band data is approximately less than 16 KB. I don't have the exact number, but if you want to play safe, don't go beyond 10. Fair enough? Um, and if, you, if you're sending data in-band, the requirement is that you must set the MIME type because invocation framework can't really guess there, because there's no files, there's no extensions involved, so you must set the MIME type to define your content. And the data attribute of your invocation request object will contain the in-band data. You can set that by simply calling invoke request dot set data with whatever byte. Why do I keep pressing that? I'm tired. Um, so you set that by calling invoke request dot set data with whatever data you want it to set to. Now, we know how to create a client, sorry, how to invoke or how to get invoked, and there are different ways to do it. Um, but do you guys, as an application developer, want to show up in platform applications or want to invoke platform application? Hell yes. And for that, we have what we call them platform actions. So these actions are used by core applications that means it's understood by core applications. It could be to invoke a core application or to get invoked by a core application. And the list of platform actions are pretty limited, and we're trying to keep the set to a minimum as much as we can. But then again, if you want to define your own custom action, 
knock yourself out, define any custom action you want. Um, but there is one, the one caveat to that is that no one will know your custom action. Right? You define a custom action, you register as a target for that, who would know? So for that, um, we're going to take an initiative to host a web page on our developer website so that people can add their, uh, what you call it, their target filters in that page and be discoverable by other developers. So it's, uh, you can document it in your own website or you can also choose to uh, post it up on our website as well. Using platform actions has one more advantage other than being well known. You can add it as an action in your application. You cannot do it for custom actions. So what's, what happens is if you're using a platform action, say to invoke, right, in Cascades, in your QML file, you guys know about action items in QML? Action items are just menu actions, right? That shows up in menu, and the user can select to do something. So how you add an action item to Cascades or a Cascades application is you add action items, item objects, and each action item will become a menu item. Instead of using action item, you could use invoke action item with a platform action and uh, wrapped up in a query. So what's gonna happen is, well, this invoke action item is saying um, it wants to open image slash PNG file. So as soon as you add that to any of your Cascades page, what's gonna happen is a open um, action will show up on your crosscut menu. And when the user selects it, the invocation framework is going to query all the targets that can open PNG files and show a nice list of what those targets are. So it provides the user the list of choices that the user can choose, and then the user can select one, and that way uh, you can invoke or your app from your application, the user can invoke another application to open PNG files. Now this is, in a way, unbound invocation, but under the hood, um, if you go deep enough, you'll see that it's actually a bound invocation because it's what it does, it actually does a query, then user selects a target, then the framework automatically does a bound invocation with whatever request you have. Now, you can also do bound invocation using invoke action item. All you need to do is specify a target ID in your invoke action item object. All right, that brings us to the invocation demo. Last time we did it in, in Orlando, uh, we didn't have much to show, but this time we do have a working demo um, that, that's available on black, GitHub, uh, sorry, blackberry.github.com and you can download the code and reuse the code wherever you want. So if I can get a switch back to HDMI. All right, so I have five applications here, but pay attention to the top left two. So there's the invoke client and there's the invoke target. So the target I have here register, actually registers multiple targets and we will see as we go through the demo. So let's open the invoke client which basically gives you a very simple user interface that can, where you can select what action you want to invoke, uh, what um, MIME type you want to set, what URI you want to give, what's the inbound data. In this case, I just type test data. And you can also do bound invocation by specifying target ID. So you fill all that up and you, do, you can do a query or you can also do an unbound invocation. So I'm just gonna do a query just to show you what it looks like. So this user interface is not coming from the framework. This is coming from my code, right? So I did a query, I got the result back, and I'm showing the results in some um, not so appropriate buttons, right? Um, so as soon as I did the query, let's go back and um, see what query did we, we did. We did a query for open action with the MIME type image slash PNG with some in-band data. So we did a query, and here are the targets that, that are capable of carrying out this action. What I'm gonna do is, do you see the com.example targets? All of these targets come from the invoke targets application that I have installed here. 
By the way, the invoke target application is also available on GitHub. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to choose is um, either com example open image one or open image two. Let's choose one. So what it does is invokes the open image one target of the invoke target application. And you can see as the target, it actually shows, uh, got all the parameters that we sent them, uh, sent it as the invocation request. So first of all, it's, you can see the startup mode being invoked, which means you are invoked, not launched from home screen. You can see the source. You can see which target of your application got invoked. In this case, it's open image one. You can see the MIME type. There was no URI, so it's blank. And you also got the in-band data, which comes as test data, just like we were expecting. Now, if you close this app, that's the target app, and launch the target directly from the home screen, what you're going to see is all those parameters are blank because you were not invoked. And the startup mode is launch. So that means you're launched from home screen. So you can differentiate the experience based on that. All right. So that wraps up the demo for invocation of applications in a new window. Can I get a switch back to the slides, please? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can I switch back to the HDMI, please? You're pushing it. It'll definitely work. I'm that confident, sorry. All right, so invoke target goes, and I do a query. I open, open image one, bam. Minimize it. I invoke open image two. So it gets you the request as is, as sent by the invoke client. Cool. You believe me now? Yeah. Uh, it is saying launched because um, the problem is your application was already launched. So you cannot really, you couldn't really check the startup mode. But you still know that you're invoked because your invoked signal got called. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's switch back to the slides. Got some very exciting stuff to share. OK, so now we're moving on to invocation cards. You guys probably have heard about this in the keynote. But we're opening the capabilities for third-party developers to create invocation cards. What the hell is invocation cards? Invocation cards provides, why don't I bring that slide on? It provides an embedded experience um, for the targets. So when you, so far what you've seen is we invoke an application, it gets invoked in a new window. Not the best experience, but what would be really cool is what if you could borrow a page or a chunk of the target application and embed it right into your application without any application grid presents of the target. So the target will not be opened in a new window. It's going to be embedded right into your application. So definitely the best experience you want to shoot for. If you can do it card, never do application invocation. Right? Always prefer using cards. Um, if you're a target, try to expose a card instead of just an application target. All right. So it has no app grid presents. And the best part, the part that really differentiates this experience in the industry today is it supports peak. So when a card comes in, the user might be saying, what did I do? So you want to peek back to the calling application or the card underneath it, um, you know, knock yourself out. So you can, you can invoke one card. That card can invoke another card. That card can invoke another card or in between your application can invoke another card. So it all gets stacked up in a navigation pane in your application. It's a very nice experience, very embedded. Uh, that's what you really want to shoot for. And when it comes to cards, there are really three types of cards. Let's call it three styles of cards. There is a composer type card, there's a previewer type, and there's a picker type card. What these types really do 
at the end of the day, they're all cards. You're free to put in anything you want in your card. But what these styles determine is the peak behavior, how the user is able to peek back and forth, and the transition style, how the card flies into the screen or flies out from the screen as you close the card. So those are the only two things that, that is um, determined by the card style. So when you define an invoke target or a card target, you need to choose one of those three. So whatever makes sense for you, just pick one. Yes? Great question. So the question is, this is, the, this is a way to invoke multiple instances of the same application. The answer is absolutely right. There can be five cards used by five applications at the same time coming from the same application. Right, right, right. And um, uh, going forward, can we please keep the questions for the end? Got a, quite a bit of content to go through, and very important part of the presentation is invocation cards. But I do welcome your questions. So there are two types of transitions. One is flying from right. This is used by previewer type cards. So if you have a previewer card, if you're invoking a previewer card, you can expect it's going to slide in from the right. Now there is a flying from bottom. This is used by the other two types, the composer and picker. So all these types of cards fly in from the bottom. Now the peak behavior is, there's really three types of peak behavior. The first one is navigational peak to parent. Sorry for the terms, don't pay attention. Here's what it is. This is used for previewers and pickers. And when the user drags the content to the right, it actually peeks back to the parent. In this case, parent means the card or the application right before it. So whatever is right before the card itself in the navigation stack is going to be peeked at. And and if you drag far enough, namely more than 50% of the screen and release, it's going to close the card. Because it has the capability to close the card, it's called a navigational peak. So it's a peak to parent, and it's a navigational peak. That's why it's called a navigational peak to parent. Now for previewer, there is something called navigation peak to root. So if you have five cards stacked up on the screen, and the user can drag the back button, what that's going to do is that's going to um, move all the five cards together to the right, and it's going to peek back to the very root of the navigation pane. So different ways to peek, both are supported by previewer. And if you um, release the, this kind of peek uh, when you're more than 50% across, it's going to close all the cards in the stack. However, if there is a dirty card in between, for example, a composer card that has some changes, you didn't save it, it's not going to do that. It's just going to fall back in place. Very smart, right? Um, never lose any data. The composer cards supports a peak behavior called modal peak to parent. So this is still a parent peak. It peaks to the card right before it or the screen right before it. But it's a, mo excuse me. It's a modal peak because no matter how far you go across while peaking, it'll never close the card. It'll always fall back in place. Because composers are usually meant for, you know, the user should be able to choose save or cancel or something. So you, user cannot, we cannot allow the user to accidentally close a composer card that's dirty. So any dirty composer card cannot be closed uh, by content peaking. So let's look at the life cycle of a card. The invocation cards has three states. It could be invoked state. It could be an invoked state, um, which basically stands for its name. When you get invoked, you're in invoked state. Now, when the user closes the card or your card is done, you closed yourself or the parent closed you or the client, the calling application closed you, um, in those cases, one of two things can happen. You can either be put in a pool of cards that are cached, or you can be closed. But that really is up to the invocation framework when it's going to pull you or when it's going to close you. It, 
pulls your card because sometimes a card may be used frequently. So in those cases, um, when, you in, when you invoke it for the first time, it might take a bit of time to load the application and load the card. But from that point on, if it's pulled, it's going to slide in the card right away without any delay. And it goes to the close state when the framework decides that you no longer need to be pulled. I'm just going to close you. And as a card, you do get these events back when you're pulled, when you're closed. So the rule of thumb is when you're pulled, make sure you clean up your UI. You're good to go for the next invocation. And when you're closed, obviously, you delete your UI as well. Now, how do we invoke cards? It's the exact same process of doing an application invocation. So everything we've learned for invocation so far remains true. But there is some additional signals that you can connect to when you invoke a card as a client or as a parent. So there are three extra signals to connect to uh, when it comes to invoking cards. You can connect to the child card done. This is triggered when the child card or the card is done with its job and it's closed itself and it actually is capable of sending you back some response. So for example, if you are using a file picker, user selects a bunch of files, presses OK, the card goes away, but you need to know which files were selected. That, makes, that happens through this child card done signal. So your application is going to get the signal, and in this signal, you're going to parse the response sent from the child card. And we're, we're making it even better by giving you signals for peak started and peak ended. So for some applications, if you open a card and the uh, user starts peaking back, you might want to show a custom experience in that, in that state. So as soon as the peak starts, you get an event, do whatever you want. And as soon as the peak ends, you also get an event and do whatever you want. Now, like I said, when you invoke a card, always expect a response unless the user closed the card using a navigational um, peak or a navigational um, swipe, or if you closed the card before it was done. So if the card was done and it closed itself, it had a chance to respond back to you, it's going to send you some response. So expect a response for normal operation. So what you do? You simply connect with the child card done signal with whatever slot you have. And in that slot, what you're going to get is something called a card done message. In that message, you will have a data, a data type describing the content of the data, and a reason code. Now, the child card can put anything he wants, it wants in those response. So there has to be a contract between you and the card you're calling so that you understand what you're expecting. And two more signals to connect is to listen for peaks. So you can connect to peak started. That's thrown when a peak uh, gesture is started. To back to your parent. And you can also connect to peak ended, which is thrown when the peak is ended. Now let's look at the other side. How do you become a card registration. Sorry. <laughs> All right. How do you become a card? So everything else remains the same. The only difference is in the type tag, instead of saying it's an application target, you're going to say, I'm a card target, and also say what kind, of card, what kind of card you are. So in this case, we're saying I'm a previewer type card. Everything else, all the, all the other syntax remains the same. Now, how do you handle card invocations? Same way as you handle application invocations, but there are two extra events that you might want to connect to. One is the card resize event. So sometimes an application may have a title bar, in which case you don't really have the full real estate of the screen. So you don't have the full screen to use for your card, so your card will get a signal saying what size you have to fit yourself in. So you can take some action to lay out your UI so that it fits nicely with the space available. You can also connect to the card pooled signal. 
that'll tell you when the card got pulled by the framework for faster execution or the uh, consecutive uh, or the um, following executions. So you might want to connect to the, both of these signals um, to make sure your card is very robust. Now, how do you respond to the client? So you're a card, you've done your job, you want to respond back to the client. All you do is create a card done message object, set the data, set the data type, set the reason, and just call invoke manager dot send card done with your message object. And what it's going to do is it's not only going to close your card, it's also going to send this message or response back to the calling application. So that brings us to the cards demo, which I really can't wait to show off. All right. So uh, can I get a switch back to HDMI, please? There is a one thing I did miss to show you um, when it came to invo invoking application, and that is, remember the platform actions we talked about and how you can add an invoke action item in your QML? Um, this is what it looks like. So if, you, if you're seeing the third action from left, which is called open in, so uh, what I did is I basically added an invoke action item with the query for image slash PNG with an action BB action open, and that's all I did, and it's placed an action item in my action bar called open in. I did not type in open in. It's um, this string as well as the icon is pulled from the system. And you select that and slides in a card that, I shouldn't say card here, slides in a sheet that has all the targets that are capable of doing this invocation. Now, this sheet did not come from my code. This is again coming from the invocation framework. And by no means this UI is final. It looks pretty ugly right now. And you can pick one of the targets that can do this. So my invoke target application, like I said, has five, uh, has five targets defined. So it actually lists all five of them because all of them actually can open PNG files. Anyways, now that we have said that, let's look at cards, the most, more exciting part. So let's uh, do a query with these um, parameters. And what you're seeing here is three cards, com example, card previewer, picker, and composer. And we're going to see each of them. So let's open Previewer first. As you can see, it's taking some time because it's loading for the first time, right? And, and the invocation as usual, right? So you get all the parameters and everything you need from the client uh, as part of the invoke request. Now you can either, you can choose to peek back to the parent. Um, I'm peeking from the content right now. And if you peek back far enough, and release it, it's going to close the card. Let's do that one more time. So if I peek back, notice that the peak status label says started. I actually connected to the peak started um, signal. So it's actually showing that peak has started. So as soon as I release it, it's going to get a peak ended uh, signal. To show that off, I want to close this card so you can see it change from started to ended. So peak has ended, right? So that signal is cool as well. And let's show you how you can launch a picker. So this is a picker. There is no launch status because the card is already pulled or it's already um, in the memory. But you really don't need the launch status that much because you get an invoked signal that tells you explicitly that you're invoked. right? So. As a picker, um, sorry, as a picker, you can um, peek back, and if you release it, it falls right back back into place, because the picker has the peak behavior defined as um, modal parent peak, right? So you can't really close the card by just dragging it from left to right; it falls right back in place, and if you hit the done what you get, your, this is coming from your client, the calling app. So what you get back is a response, and I'm just printing out the response in a dialog. I'm just saying, hey, I'm done. So we can hit OK and dis dismiss that. And you can also launch composer type cards. Sorry, all my cards look the same. But they do behave differently, right? Um, so for a composer card, you can you know, peek back 
Again, it's a modal peak. You cannot really close it. And if you press done in the card, so the card now has a chance to respond back to the client because it's still in control. No one closed it. You hit done, back goes the response to the client, and the client can do whatever it wants with the response. Now, let me show you some core application cards or cards from core applications. In your Dev Alpha device, in the R9 release, you have the calendar application. And the calendar application, this is just an example, and the calendar application exposes quite a few cards. I think there are three cards. And one of them is peak event. So if I select the peak event card, it's going to slide in the calendar picker. And I have jam with invocation framework here from 445 to 545. If I select that, my application is going to get a response back with the whole calendar invite. I think it comes back in a standard format like ICS or something. Sorry, the calendar. What am I talking about? Um, so you can purse, go out and purse that request, or you can actually take that request and invoke the calendar viewer card to display that card. No, sorry, to display this information. Now you can also um, invoke the create event card that also comes from the calendar. In this case, what it does is it slides in a composer type card that lets you create an event right from your application. Does it ever feel like you're in a different application? You're still, still feels like the same application, but it's actually coming from a different application. So users in BlackBerry 10 is going to do a task using five, six, 10 applications without even knowing it. And that's a good thing, right? No one, multitasking is tough for users. And, and being a, being, have, having to switch back and forth is even harder, right? So with this kind of experience, what I'm trying to say is always go for cards. Whether you're invoking something or you're trying to get invoked, always go for cards. That just takes, makes the experience so much, so much better. So, and if I can go back to the slides again. So this sample application is fully available in our GitHub repository at blackberry.github.com. You can go in and download it. Um, before I wrap it up, I wanted to talk to you about system targets and clients. Now, there are tons of applications come launch that's going to use the invocation framework in many different ways. But however, the most common use we expect is to invoke the core applications, no matter what card they have, what application targets they have, whatever makes sense for you, just um, always try to leverage the core applications because they're guaranteed to be on the device, okay? So if you are trying to share content from your application, launch the social networking apps, if you are launch the email application, all of them will come with some kind of cards and we will be documenting each of those. So I don't have time, neither do we have a complete documentation at this point that lists all the application and all their filters so that you know what to pass on when you invoke them. Or we also need to know what do they invoke, right? Core application doesn't only get invoked, but they also invoke other applications. And they use the same framework. So you have an opportunity to integrate with core application that let the user open your applications from applications like email, calendar, or maps, I don't know, the list actually goes on. So everything you see on the screen are some kind of core applications. And all of them are integrated with invocation framework. And they'll all come with the hooks you need to get integrated with them to provide the best in-class user experience in your application. So if you are not using invocation framework in your application, something is terribly wrong. Um, I mean, users are going to look for it. Because there are, tons, there are going to be tons of applications that's going to set the bar so high when it comes to integrating with the system itself that you will be virtually forced to use this framework. So please, uh, before it's too late, make sure your application is integrated with the core application or system targets that makes the most sense. Okay? Not all applications will integrate with all applications. 
It's only with the application where it makes sense. And usually, it's going to be mostly invoking the social networking apps to share content generated by your application to the user's social network. Now, like I said, the sample application is available today, actually before today, on our GitHub repository, which is at github.com slash BlackBerry, and under the Cascade Samples folder. And it has both the invoke client as well as the invoke target that I've shown off here. And the documentation for invocation framework is available at developer.blackberry.com. You just pick which platform you want to code in. Could it be native? Could it be HTML5? Invocation framework will be available on all platforms. And some final thoughts is do not reinvent. Well, we should not reinvent what's already on the device, especially if it's a core application that already does it for you. We should instead leverage those applications to do the tasks that we want our application to let the user do. And discover new apps through invocation framework, through its queries, through its unbound invocation. Let the user discover apps. And also get discovered by making yourself a target so that other applications can invoke you as well. Now, being a target makes your application 10 times better because it's more engaging for the user. The user will use your app more frequently. And your application's value will be 10 times more to the user, undoubtedly. So before I finish up, I had to say this to you. Join the roundtable for this session at 6 PM. I'll be available in a, one of the roundtables. Um, and continue the conversation on Twitter. Our hashtag is BBJam, or if you want to talk about that's not this session ID. Um, I think it's Jam 21, isn't it? So if you want to talk about this session, just um, get Jam 21. Um, hashtag in your tweets. We're going to follow that. Jam 20, sorry. So it's Jam 20. Sorry, I had like, so many sessions today. Um, and do not download the BlackBerry Jam America's mobile application. Um, give us reasons for the 10,000 reasons why you believe in BlackBerry. There's a video boot round down there if you want to be on TV. It's your chance. And that brings me to my slide again, where I say thank you. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Yes? The question is, can a card invoke another card? Yes, definitely. Yes? The question is, uh, will the actions be defined in a constant, or is it still a freeform string like bb.action.open? Uh, I haven't seen a plan to define them in constants. Um, it's, it's still a string. Um, and I haven't seen a plan to change that way. Yes? <laughs> yes. So. It's a very good question. So if there are multiple targets for a specific invoke request, how does the invocation framework choose the best one? Or what is the best one? So <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of criteria. The first few criteria, uh, I can't remember all of them, but for the first few criteria say the strongest match, goes with the strongest match of the URI, strongest match of the MIME type. Say one application says image slash star, but you said image slash PNG, you will be invoked. Correct. Right. So. Um, and another, another uh, criteria for the target selection process is that if there is a system application for doing something, the system application is always preferred if there is a strong match of the parameters. Hold it. Hold your tomatoes. However, I'm fighting for it. So be my, OK, be on my side. So but I've convinced them to at least let the user choose which one is supposed to be the default, just like we do on PC today, right? It's the best way to do. So it's gone, not going to be there at launch, but it will be there post-launch. So they're definitely working on it. That's a very good question. I can't, can't answer sensitive app questions like that. Uh, browser is a very sensitive one, sorry. Yes. Um, who did I point to? You.
Um, to be honest, um, there is, let me see if I have it here. Yeah, so like I said, there's a whole bunch of action matching criteria. I'm sure you can't read it. That's why I put it up there. No. So um, it, it does action matching, uh, type matching to decide which one is the best. And then it does target selection. Uh, during an unbound invocation, the IF first brokers invoke message and then selects a suitable target. Um, and the target selection has a whole bunch of criteria as well. Um, let's not go through this now. Um, we are going to document this. We are going to be absolutely transparent about how the target is selected, how the brokering process works. But I honestly haven't heard about bubbling up, the bubbling up process. But there is a concept that's being discussed internally called uh, frequency. So it's frequency plus um, recency, right? How recent the user invoked it or how frequent it was. But that, all that will be get overridden by the default application if it's the strongest match. Right? So once we have tar a default target management by the user, then you guys will have a chance to replace core applications. But before we do that, we can't really allow third parties to override the experience. One more question, then we're done. Um, so the question is, can we enumerate third party cards? Absolutely. So when you do a query, you not only get third-party cards, you also get any cards or any application target that can handle that invocation. You can go through the list and pick whoever you want to choose. Absolutely. Same thing as far as invocation goes. Yeah. So um, just put this slide up just so you have my contact. So with that, I mean, Here's my email address. Here's my Twitter handle. I'm good at both. If you want to reach out to me about invocation, I'm the prime contact in developer relations for invocation. If you have any questions, any feature requests, any bug reports, I'm the guy to make that happen, or at least try to make that happen. So please email me or tweet. Send your tweets to me related to invocation, and we'll try our best to help you. Thank you very much and see you at the round table back there.